Okay, um, I think we can uh, get started at this point. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us at this next webinar of our GMF webinar series, where every month we feature thematic presentations focused on GMF programs. My name is Sharon Levitsky, project coordinator with the Green Municipal Funds Capacity Development Team. And I'm here today with my colleague, Paulina Asensio, Capacity Development Project Officer, who is producing today's session. And I would like to start today's webinar with a land acknowledgement. On behalf of FCM, I'd like to begin the session by acknowledging that I am joining you from lands that have been inhabited by indigenous peoples for thousands of years. We at FCM recognize the Algonquin Anishinaabe people as the traditional custodians of the land upon which FCM's offices are located. I personally am located in Montreal, Quebec, recognizing it as the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Kanyankahaga peoples. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and all First Nations, both in shaping and strengthening this community and country as a whole. Wherever you are, please join me in paying our respects to the original stewards of this land and committing ourselves to thoughts and actions that will lead to meaningful reconciliation wherever we live now. The webinar today is about affordable housing and energy poverty under the umbrella of our sustainable affordable housing initiative. And before we dive in, there are a few housekeeping items to get through. Each of our presenters has prepared a 15 uh, minute presentation. So there are two, two 15 minute presentations to share with you today. Uh, we're going to run through each presentation one after the other and use our remaining time for discussion and Q&A at the end. For your awareness, um, I will use a sound signal as a time reminder for our speakers. So if you hear a noise, don't worry. It's not that I've forgotten to turn off my alarm. Um, you are welcome to ask questions uh, through the Q&A box during the presentation in the language of your choice, as well as the chat. And we'll keep an eye out for any clarification questions or other key items that we should address before the Q&A session at the end. And et finalement, un dernier rappel que si vous souhaitez écouter la présentation en français, vous devez sélectionner le bouton Simultaneous Interpretation au bas de votre écran. Et vous pouvez alors choisir l'option français. Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM, is the national voice of local governments in Canada. FCM's mandate includes delivering programs that build municipalities' capacity to do what they do best, deliver innovative, cost-effective local solutions to environmental challenges and to enhance quality of life for their citizens. The Green Municipal Fund is our largest program and is funded by the Government of Canada. It has the double mandate to support municipal initiatives and sustainable development through funding and share knowledge and lessons learned through online resources and tools, trainings, and peer learning and networking activities. Today, our topic uh, comes out of our Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative, or SAW for short. Our goal today is to introduce you to aff sustainable affordable housing through an energy poverty perspective. So there will be an overview of energy efficiency and energy poverty within affordable housing, as well as a look at our featured project today, which is the Rosslands Yard Yards project in British Columbia. And there will be a Q&A period at the end where we will answer any questions you might have. So to look at uh, SAW, GMF's uh, 300 million sustainable affordable housing initiative helps affordable housing providers build and retrofit 
energy efficient, affordable homes that emit less GHGs. This program helps municipalities achieve triple bottom line benefits in the housing sector by reducing energy and GHG intensity, increasing energy and housing affordability, as well as a number of social aspects, such as improving building quality, increasing resident comfort, and health and quality of life. SAW enables housing providers to better plan, build, operate, and maintain energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. So this is an overview of the funding that is offered by the Sustainable Affordable Housing Initiative. We offer a variety of grants and loans to support your initiatives at various project stages. And during the webinar today, a link to the SAW webpage will be posted in the chat so that you can read more information about our offers. If you're wondering about whether or not your project could be eligible for a SAW grant or loan, here are some of the requirements. Uh, for an organization to be eligible for our funding, the lead applicant must be either a municipal government, a municipally owned corporation, or a nonprofit housing provider or cooperative. For a project to be eligible for funding, we have both an energy efficiency and an affordability requirement. From an affordability perspective, rents for at least 30% of the units of a project must be less than 80% of the local median market rent. Retrofit projects must aim to achieve at least a 25% reduction. New build projects must aim to achieve net zero energy ready. And with that, we move on to our first presentation. So, Abilash Kantamemni Kantamneni, um, or Abi, is an energy is an efficiency Canada research associate specializing in energy poverty and low income energy efficiency. He is actively involved in affordable housing, including serving on boards and conducting research on behalf of nonprofit housing providers since first moving to Canada six years ago. And with that, uh, Avi, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, off we go. So I'm here today, uh, thank you for having me FCM. I'm here today uh, to speak about the promises and the challenges of working both on improving energy efficiency, reducing energy poverty, while also maintaining affordability and housing stability. Let me start by doing this. I wanna ask you a question before you get a chance to ask me questions later on. All right, your slides Robert, are not up yet. What's that, what's that, sorry? Your slides are not up yet. No way, okay, let me try again. Did that work? Okay, there you go, continue on All with right. the question. Oh, fantastic. Um, thanks, Sharon, for, uh, <laughs> for intervening. What what is energy what does energy poverty look like in your line of work? Just type in the first thing that comes to your mind and we will sort through the answers. So put it in the chat if you can. I know all of you have um, encountered it in some capacity in your work, either with housing providers or with municipalities. What does energy poverty look like? And then I'll circle back on those responses. I'm gonna draw uh, an analogy from uh, my background, I moved here from India originally, and there's a, there's a story in Indian mythology about uh, six blindfolded people uh, who first encounter an elephant. Uh, based on their limited ex life experiences, they each encounter it in a different way. So one person holds on to the tail and thinks it's a rope. One person uh, touches the tusk and thinks it's a spear and so on. Uh, and this analogy is very uh, appropriate when trying to understand and describe what energy poverty looks like, especially in the Canadian context. 
Uh, it's a misunderstanding to think that energy poverty is just another facet of just being poor. Energy poverty is not just not being able to pay your energy bill. It's actually a lot more uh, expansive than that. So one aspect of energy poverty is just uh, paying your energy bills might put you at risk from being able to afford other household essentials. Um, paying for energy bills can push your household into poverty, even if you weren't already below a federal low income. Uh, research has shown that um, uh, houses that um, are have leaks uh, or drafts, uh, not uh, inadequate insulation, uh, end up having uh, damp spots or mold or rot developing within uh, the uh, the housing unit. Uh, it leads these. It shows that it leads uh, er energy poverty and inadequate uh, energy use in housing leads to cardiovascular diseases, mental health issues, uh, reduced uh, yeah, you know brain capacity to to do executive functions. Uh, uh, energy poverty also looks like. Uh, inadequately being able to heat or cool your home. Uh, it looks like um, leaky uh, leaky drafts from under your door. Uh, it looks like your inability to keep your home warm and comfortable to meet your needs as a home. And this disproportionately affects uh, households that spend a lot of time indoors. So seniors, um, and single parents with kids, uh, for example. And, and more importantly, especially now at a time with, uh, uh, with increasing effects of climate change being evident and visible all around us, uh, energy poverty also looks like the inability to withstand extreme heat events. And, and you know, we don't need to look too far behind us in the past or far away from Canada to remember um, the devastating impacts of the heat dome in BC just a, a year or so ago. Uh, and how, and that, an inability to be able to be comfortable in your home to withstand extreme heat events uh, is also a part of energy poverty. So my the definition of energy poverty that a lot of researchers and practitioners are increasingly using in, in Canada and, and elsewhere is that energy poverty on a spectrum is on the other end of energy well-being. And what energy well-being means is when households are able to obtain adequate energy services to support well-being in their own homes. And so this relationship between households, individuals, families, their homes, and their well-being in their homes is mediated by energy services. So being able to access adequate and appropriate energy to meet their needs in their homes so that it supports their well-being looks like energy well-being and when not when they're not able to do that then you start sliding into energy poverty so knowing this in your role what do you think are three main entry points into eliminating or reducing energy poverty so that we can improve well-beings of canadians uh, in their own homes you can try uh, a, typing up a response in the chat and we can revisit some of these responses if you want to play your cards close to the chest, that's fine too. We can get into it in the discussion. Um, energy poverty is caused by, or I should say actually the determinants of energy poverty and entry points into reducing energy poverty in your capacity, in your professional roles. It comes down to uh, one of three things or a relationship between these three things. Um, so number one, high energy costs or rates, number two, low incomes, and number three, inefficient homes. Uh, it's, there's an interplay between these three factors that contributes to energy poverty in different contexts, but end of the day, it comes down to one of these three things. Now, I have been involved with uh, social housing sector for uh, since the day I moved here to Canada, around six years, five and a half years ago. And I know that there are a lot of miracle workers in the sector, right? There's a lot of superheroes in the sector, and I look up to a lot of them. But some things I have to admit might be beyond our capacity to deliver in our roles working with affordable housing. Uh, high energy costs or rates are set by factors beyond 
individual control, you know, of war in Ukraine, uh, global supply crisis. There's factors beyond our ability to control high energy rates and costs. Uh, low incomes. Yes, there is. I know that there are a lot of uh, active efforts uh, with sort of client-centered, tenant-centered efforts uh, led by housing providers that help them connect uh, with employment opportunities to help elevate their incomes. But speaking more broadly, uh, lifting households, uh, having households having access to more money so they can ins install the upgrades necessary in their homes to meet their needs is, is beyond perhaps the magic wand of the miracle workers and affordable housing sector. But what is firmly within our control uh, and the, the clearest entry point for people like us in the sector is uh, taking action on inefficient home. Regardless of what happens with energy rates, regardless of what happens with income, if we all lived in uh, high performing homes, we could blunt the negative impacts of some of those other factors. Uh, and being able to provide, uh, improve the energy efficiency of homes uh, is uh, the strongest tool in our affordable housing toolbox uh, that we can help uh, renters and people of, of um, all across the income chain and all across the housing spectrum have access to more affordable uh, house that meets the energy needs and well-being in their homes. Um, I will end with this. This is a, a research project that we are working on right now that I'm leading at Efficiency Canada is trying to uh, uh, find a pathway towards um, oftentimes, right, we are the, the um, affordability of housing versus energy performance and sustainability and net zero goals are often described uh, almost as a trade off. Yeah, that maybe you can do one without the other. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that uh, we think, and the research we're working on uh, is, is, is trying to trace uh, that you know, we don't have to compromise between having affordable housing and having uh, housing that meets our energy needs today and tomorrow in the future. And in fact, our inability to do so reflects our inability to find the right mix of policies that can do achieve both those outcomes uh, at scale. Uh, so where we are would be in the bottom left quadrant today, I'd describe as a, as a policy ecosystem with two sad caps uh, where we have insecure housing that is unaffordable uh, and inefficient. If uh, municipalities focused only on energy efficiency, only on net zero, and had, let's say, very stringent requirements saying the only housing we will build will be net zero and this and this and that, then what that would do, especially when we're talking about a retrofit code, is energy uh, retrofits can be very intense, very uh, disruptive to existing tenants, and this can lead without adequate tenant supports can lead to disruption, displacement, and what's called renovation, eviction in the guise of renovations. If we, what some other jurisdictions in Europe and US do is that they have an exemption for affordable housing providers. So they'll have a minimum energy efficiency standards for housing, but they'll say, if you offer affordable housing, maybe you don't have to comply with those rules. That might not also be desirable because in the long run, what happens is that rental housing and affordable housing end up being substandard because they're not complying with these regulations. Um, they're not complying with performance regulations. So you end up with substandard and uncomfortable housing. Uh, and the goal, uh, the policy goal, and I'm sure we can all agree, uh, if we are aiming towards something, we'd like to live in a world uh, with two happy cats, is to try to find the balance of policies that combines uh, a strong focus on energy efficiency while expanding tenant rights and, 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 and having adequate supports so that we're also maintaining affordability and housing stability. Uh, the report is expected to come out in January and I'm happy to share that with folks if they're interested. Let me know. The most important ingredient of getting to the, the top right quadrant uh, is collaboration um, between housing providers and uh, municipalities. And, I'm, and I'm, I think that the next presentations will reflect on some of these experiences led by housing providers uh, and how a collaborative environment can be nurtured by municipalities seeking to achieve the outcomes in the top right quadrant. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions later on. Cheers. Uh, can I so stop much. sharing my screen now, Sharon? Yeah, absolutely. Right yeah, thank you so much, Avi, for the very uh, insightful presentation on 
energy poverty and how that really affects uh, affordable housing and renters. And with that, uh, we'll be moving on to the next presentation. Uh, so this next presentation features uh, City of Rothland, BC and the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society. So one of our presenters is Stacy Lightburn, who is a manager of planning and development slash approving officer at the city of Rosslyn, BC. With nearly 20 years experience as a municipal planner in Rosslyn, Stacy leads long range strategic and current planning projects in Rosslyn. As a lifelong ski bum, she recognizes that Rosslyn is a great place to work play and live and works hard to manage growth and still maintain the authentic small town resort community that she loves. And our second presenter here is Tanya Dale, Affordable Housing Administrator at the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society. Tanya has always been interested in the natural environment and was deeply influenced by spending time in her youth at wildlife centers and in nature. She has a degree in environment management from Royal Roads University and worked nearly a decade at the City of Calgary in environmental education and construction. Tanya is new to the field of affordable housing and is focused on doing work that improves the lives of people in her community. So with that, Stacy, if you would like to put up your slides first. Great, looks good. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, this is, yep, so um, Sharon, thanks for the introduction. Um, so this is the story of the Rosslyn Yards project. It's a net zero ready, mixed use, affordable workforce housing with a city hall on the bottom floor. It's currently in the process of being built and it will hopefully be finished in the spring of next year. So first of all, um, where is Rossland? So Rossland is a small community in the mountains at about a thousand meters of elevation. It's about halfway between Vancouver and Calgary, um, just about 10 kilometers north of the US border. It's on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Sinaiax people and other indigenous people who also walked on and cared for this land. Um, it's the home of Red Mountain Ski Resort, which was the home of several Olympians, in, including Nancy Green and Karen Lee Gartner, who were gold medalists in skiing. So it's a highly desirable, beautiful little community that is is growing and experiencing the challenges of a growing community. So the story of Rosslyn Yards is a combination of a number of aspects. So from it started from city land, the housing challenges, the city's climate action policies, partnerships with other organizations, and of course, the money. So I'll go through each of these one by one. It really started with uh, city land. And I think that's where we had the most advantage to develop the project um, in that we had a really good land in a great location. It was the former highways works yard for the province that the city purchased in 2005. And at that time, we went through a neighborhood planning process to see what could possibly go on that land. It, it's beautiful and flat right in the center of town. Um, there were a number of ideas came up in 2006, one of which was affordable housing and another which also was city, uh, city hall and number and parks. And there was a number of ideas put out at that time. And then it sat for a number of years empty and in 2015, then council decided that it was time to do something about this land. 
um, as it was a brownfield site because it also back in the gold mining days of Rawson was also a railways yards, hence the name Rawson Yards. Um, so it, it did require some environmental remediation, which was also completed during that time. Um, in 2017, the city subdivided the land so that it could um, be developed for a number of different projects. Um, the east side of it was developed into a skate park and the west side was set aside for this project, the Ross and Yards project. So at the time, like in the late 2000s, so around 2016, 17, as Rawson was starting to grow, it was historically a relatively affordable community. But as it started to grow, um, Rawson experienced the same challenges that, you know, a number of other larger municipalities like Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, uh, were experiencing with affordability. We were starting to see that in our small town. And um, that was challenging for the tourism economy, um, just to have a diverse workforce and community. Um, it, people were starting to move away because of the challenges. So the city undertook a housing needs assessment to see where we were experiencing issues with our needs. And it found that the main housing gaps were in market rental and workforce housing um, in order to service the uh, tourism economy, as well as subsidized rental housing and accessible housing. Um, it's a largely single family community. And although we're working towards developing more and more multifamily and infill housing, um, that doesn't happen overnight. The city also has a number of climate action policies and projects. So over a number of years, we've been working towards reducing the GHG emissions in our community through a number of efforts through from transportation. Uh, we have EV chargers and bike lanes and active transportation routes in the community. We're trying to develop infill housing as much as possible. Um, we're also incentivizing any new buildings in the city to um, adopt the energy, BC Energy Step Code, which is an energy efficiency program that the province has. So we're, the city is incentivizing and now requiring new builds to um, conform to step three of the building code, uh, uh, the BC uh, Step Code, which is uh, highly energy efficient. So then we have this land, we have these climate action policies, we have housing challenge. So we, council of the day decided that the old BC Highways Works Yard or this land we were talking about was a good place to develop an affordable housing building. So we partner with the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society, which run a number of affordable housing projects, not only in our community, but also in the neighboring communities in our region. Um, they were a small nonprofit and this significantly uh, will increase their number of uh, houses that they will be managing. So as well as that, um, in 2018, um, the roof of our old city hall collapsed um, and so that left us without a building. And we had already thought that um, we were in need of a newer building anyway, because the, the old building was out, we were outgrowing that space. So with this unique partnership that we had developed with the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society, we decided that this was a also a good project to have City Hall on the bottom floor with the housing units above. So right now what's being built is City Hall on the lower floor with 37 affordable housing units on the upper three floors above that. Um, and with that, we partnered with the CBT and BC Housing 
in order to get the funds and prepare the project um, for development. Um, and as we were developing it, because of our um, climate action policies, the city wanted to see the building being built to the highest energy efficiency possible. Um, this was not possible in, in our current budget. We are a small community of 4,000 people. We don't have money growing on trees. And the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society also is a nonprofit. So we looked to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, FCM, in this grant program that is being discussed today. And um, we were accepted into that grant. So how were we able to finance it? Um, it the FCM contributed uh, part grant and part loan, um, BC Housing as well, and the city contributed for the city hall portion of the building. And the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society also has a mortgage on the property. So the FCM grant and loan will significantly reduce the annual operating costs while achieving climate, the city's climate action goal. As well, in the long term, the project will generate property taxes from the affordable housing units, which will offset the operating costs of City Hall. So there are a few lessons learned in our project. I, I'd say the number one is city land is, like, is key for moving forward with any of project like this. Land is expensive. So to utilize land that we already have, um, to achieve the goals for the city is, is the number one lesson learned. Also, just communications. We had some challenges communicating um, what exactly was being built and where the money was coming from. Um, so we need, looking back, we need to, need, we should have communicated the full business case for the decision, not just the money. Um, there is also an opportunity. Um, it was a significant uh, loan that F from SEM and the city of Rosslyn was fortunate to be in a good financial shape to guarantee that loan. Um, but I think it, that could be challenging for other uh, nonprofits because of the s size of the loan. Um, so with that, I think that's me out of time. And uh, Tanya from the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society will present their perspective on our amazing building. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me. As I'm sure you know by now, uh, my name is Tanya Dale, and I am the Affordable Housing Administrator for the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society. Um, I have a couple members, board members with me today. Jan Morton is the president, and Patricia Marshall Thompson is the vice president of the LCAHS. Uh, things I'm going to cover in this short presentation are an introduction to the LCAHS, information about our Ross and Yards project, a little deeper than what we've heard so far. And I'll go over the efficiencies that we have incorporated into the building, which address climate change adaptations. And finally, some impacts and lessons learned. So we are located in Rossland, British Columbia on unceded Sinaiq's Katunaha and Sawapmuk land and operate within what is known locally as the Lower Columbia region. And we are an affordable housing provider. In 2007, the local economic development entity began the process of assessing housing needs, and the LCAHS was formed in 2013 to develop the affordable housing that was identified as a need in the assessment. Our vision is to provide 100 units of affordable housing by 2030. To date, we have 19 units of affordable housing, and we are in the process of building 37 in Rossland, due to be completed in spring 2023. And we have a 31 unit building in Fruitvale currently in the design phase. The lack of affordable housing in the city has resulted in many businesses struggling to keep staff, particularly in the hospitality and tourism sectors, which are key to Rossland's economy. 
Within our housing project, Ross and Yards, part of the eligibility criteria is that tenants must work at least 30 hours per week for a Ross and employer. This building will provide 37 units of housing and a positive economic impact. It is located near schools, the arena, and the skate park. It is within walking distance to shops and other amenities. Rosslyn Yards will be an energy efficient building. It is designed to achieve a 27% energy reduction based on Rosslyn's minimum building requirements. The building will be net zero ready, have continual ventilation in each suite, heat pumps for heating and cooling, LED lights, triple pane windows, and a higher grade of insulation on the foundation, roof, and exterior walls. So as you've found out through these other presentations, living in a building that is energy efficient and provides a good level of comfort is really important for adapting to climate change. A well-sealed and insulated building reduces heat loss in the winter and in turn reduces utility costs for our tenants. In short, it increases the efficacy of heating and cooling. And having the ability to cool units is really important because it means that tenants will not have to have windows open in the hot summers during forest fire season when smoke is in the air. And this season is being extended thanks to climate change. One hidden cost of housing is transportation. Rossland is on a mountain and lower income earners living in neighboring communities find daily travel to Rossland cost prohibitive not to mention that commuting is also a drain on time and affects your quality of life. Rosslyn Yards is centrally located, which makes it convenient for tenants to walk or bike to work or leisure activities. It will reduce reliance on vehicles, therefore reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Bonus for this building is each unit comes with bicycle storage and there are three electric vehicle charging stations in the parking lot. What does this mean for our tenants? Reduced heating costs means more money in tenants' pockets and their income goes further. Reduced need for heating and cooling reduces the energy demand of the building. Reduced reliance on vehicles means both a reduction in greenhouse gases and also cost reductions for residents. Better indoor air quality improves the health of all residents, adults and children. The children who will live in the building are benefited by the ventilation and noise reduction from outside. They will have a healthy space for studying or completing homework, leading to better outcomes in school and future prospects in life. While we are not yet in our building in Rossland, I can share an anecdote from one of our properties in Trail, BC. The building is called Columbia Park. It's a new build. A single mother and her child moved in. The previous place they were living was older, drafty, and full of mold. The child was sick with all sorts of respiratory conditions and needed extra care. The mother was very limited in her ability to work due to needing to care for her sick child all the time. Once moving to Columbia Park, the child's health has steadily improved and the mother is now able to work almost full time and provide more fully for her family. The child is healthy, happy and doing well. We're hopeful that we can continue to facilitate these sorts of changes and improvements in people's lives by providing quality, affordable housing. What did we learn from working with FCM? Well, the climate action policies adopted by the city of Rossland were the driver for us to apply for the FCM funding. However, we did find that the application and reporting processes are time consuming and require professional expertise that our board of volunteers just didn't have. We've had to retain consultants at an extra expense to the project. We are very fortunate to have a good um, relationship with the city of Rossland and we are well supported. Um, those who don't have municipal support will find the need for a loan guarantee to be a barrier to securing the funding. We are very happy to be able to have several units at 80% of market rates. But in turn, it does put extra pressure on the rates for the remaining units to cover the operating budget for the building. The FCM requirements also made design development more expensive and time consuming. So make sure you think of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we received $1.59 million in a grant and a $1.59 million loan from FCM for the project. And that's all I've got for you. There's our brief overview of Rosslyn Yards and our experience with FCM. 
Um, I just want to say thank you very much for having us. And I think it's time for questions now. And if there's any specific questions about um, the Housing Society, I believe Jan, our president, is on the line and she might be able to help me out because I'm pretty new here. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Stacy and Tanya, for the excellent presentations uh, featuring this really, really great project, which is definitely going to have some uh, notable and excellent impact as it keeps going. And with that, it is time for our Q&A period. Um, I saw that we already got a few questions, but as the Q&A period is going, um, if any of you has any questions, no matter how big, how small, um, you're welcome to put them into the Q&A box or into the chat box. And while they are coming in, um, I'll go through some of the questions that have already come up. And so one of the questions that has come up is for Avi. Uh, so concerning your presentation, uh, what about the idea that high performance buildings is far from a luxury or option, but is in fact essential to ensuring the long term affordability of housing units? I would wholeheartedly agree with you there. Um, I would agree with you there, Rob. Uh, what seems evident to perhaps you and I and folks in this chat. Uh, is not so self-evident in the marketplace. Um, oftentimes one of the challenges with, um, especially with retrofits, because we expect about 80% of present day, especially the rental housing stock to still be existing by the time we get to 2050 and net zero goals. Uh, a lot of the challenges with retrofitting existing stock is that the return on investment for making those retrofits uh, is not realizable uh, within a time scale that is desirable for most investors and property owners and operators. So the greatest interest, the greatest interest in maintaining affordability and maintaining high performance building at the moment is the public interest. And so opportunities like what FCM is doing, projects like what has been outlined in presentations today show that it's not just in the public interest, it's not just a national policy priority that we need uh, both long-term uh, high-performance buildings and affordability and that they actually go hand in hand. Uh, we need to demonstrate that doing so is also within the interests of, of housing developers uh, and housing providers. And I think that's the key uh, to getting to what is a, it's pretty self-evident to, uh, to both you and I. Thank you. And another question in the Q&A box. Um, one of them is being answered. And there's one. Uh, what is the current market price of a deep net zero energy retrofit? Is that question for me? Um, it came up. Well, this is popped up a couple minutes ago. So I guess whoever wants to answer the question or maybe has an answer to the question. For an energy retrofit, I guess it like, I, I would think it just depends on what uh, the type of housing we're talking about. Maybe Abby can answer that, but um, I know just for looking at uh, like a, a standard single family house in our community, the, the, the cost of a deep energy retrofit can range uh, significantly depending on the, the size and style of the house. Yeah, so I would agree with that, Stacey. That's 100% uh, correct. Um, I, some folks have done benchmarking uh, for different housing styles. And again, in Canada, we have a diversity of um, housing across different provinces. So it's hard to um, hard to answer that off the top of my head, but I, but I think based on benchmarks, 
the the price of a deep retrofit can range anywhere between for a single family home uh, between twenty to twenty twenty five thousand dollars on one end to about seventy five to one hundred thousand dollars on the other end. Um, it's the the cost difference between building a home to code and building a, a deep net zero home a new construction is significantly smaller than retrofitting existing homes because most retrofits are custom projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard to do them at scale. You have to, there's a lot of labor involved, a lot of um, capacity involved in custom designing solutions for each individual home. Um, and so uh, one of the challenges is that it's not just the cost of doing it, but uh, are our homeowners and home housing providers able to recover those costs uh, when they are able to sell the house? And most homeowners know how if they're doing a roof renovation, if they're doing adding a new kitchen countertop, what the value of that product would be if they sell it, uh, if they sell the home, uh, that directs their investment uh, decision making. The answers are not so obvious in, in deep retrofits. We may estimate the costs, uh, but we don't know what the price recovery of that is on conditional sale. I hope that helps. Thank you. And there's another question of what areas of the GMF application need to be simplified, why and how? Um, since this presentation did not directly cover the GMF application, um, if you'd like to get in touch with somebody from GMF uh, after the webinar, we'll be posting uh, contact information in the chat. And there will also be a slide with some emails if you would like to reach out to us later. Yeah, and something maybe I could just add as being with the Housing Society is the importance for us of working with a development consultant. We work with City Spaces out of um, BC who did who really submitted the application on our behalf. And, and I think it's just a lot of the, it, I'm not complaining about the application itself, it's just a lot of technical information that's needed that's beyond the capacity of your average volunteer like me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Thank you so much for that uh, for that contribution. Um, yeah. So, if whoever posted that question would like to get in touch with us or with somebody on the panel, feel free to contact us and let us know. Um, and then next one came up. Uh, do you know if there's any city? currently that has a really well-developed program policy, standard or benchmark for energy efficient, affordable housing. I believe this one was directed to Bobby, but if anyone has an answer. I can maybe take this first. Uh, hi, Nathan. I, um, I do, I can point to some examples. Um, in Toronto um, and the BC step code, Vancouver, um, you know, step code, those would be relatively good examples off the top of my head. But our <clears throat> uh, lens at Efficiency Canada is at the national level and provincial level. But so I can consult with my team uh, and, and uh, get back to you with very specific uh, details at the municipal level. Uh, what I can tell you overall is that my uh, characterization of municipal policies in being able to build energy efficient and affordable house or, or retrofitting homes compared to other jurisdictions around the world would be in the bottom left quadrant, which is where we're neither doing um, good on affordability, nor are we doing good on um, on building energy efficient homes. Uh, some examples that I would point to in other jurisdictions, for example, would be uh, in the U.S., uh, there are uh, federal and provincial uh, energy efficiency weatherization assistance programs that work with rental housing providers uh, to provide upgrades. In Canada, most affordable housing uh, providers qualify for just small upgrades like changing a light bulb and putting on a clothesline or a faucet aerator and things. In the U.S., the programs are a little deeper than that. But they're also supplemented with affordability uh, guarantees. Uh, a housing provider that receives uh, some uh, uh, an affordable housing provider ha can be a private market provider as well that receives federal funding uh, to do energy efficiency upgrades must sign a covenant that uh, requires them to maintain their units at an affordable rate. Uh, 
Uh, and so combining some of these compliance-based policies uh, for meeting certain energy, in Boulder, Colorado, for example, they have a rental housing efficiency standard that says if you're renting a home, you have to meet a, a certain a threshold for energy efficiency. And combining that with the approach that um, uh, cities like in other cities in Colorado take, which is they have a tenant eviction defense fund where you as a tenant have a codified right to legal representation and tenant supports if you're being evicted. So improving energy efficiency, using public money to improving energy efficiency and combining that with expanding tenant rights would be the best application of, of in my view, our best application of uh, uh, federal funding and policy is by we can't achieve energy efficient housing without um, also expanding tenant rights. Right now in Canada, I'd say it's hard for me to pick a city that's shining um, really well on both of these because the baseline level is very low in Canada, okay. unfortunately. Okay, and for the final question today, and if you have any other questions, again, you will be more than welcome to uh, get in touch with us later. Uh, so this is a question for everyone. Are there debtors who respect housing as a human right, or do all financiers want to know they will make profit? Jan, did you answer? You were muted. No. Sorry, Tanya, I don't really fully understand the question, so. Um... I can probably try taking a stab at it, and I welcome other people stepping in. Um, uh, declaring something as a right by a loan is not sufficient. If um, people are not able to assert their rights um, in, in a place that respects those rights. Um, the challenge with uh, renters, and we know if you look at data on evictions in Canada, a large number of evictions are initiated by landlords um, and most, uh, most adjudications at um, rental tenant board hearings in, in provinces across the country are adjudicate, adjudicated on behalf of landlords. And landlords, especially private um, uh, corporate landlords, uh, are more legally savvy and have an ability to navigate the system in ways that renters and, and people with uh, you know uh, financial challenges um, are not able to. So I think Canada's done a, a great first step in asserting that housing is a human right. And I would my view, my personal view would be that enshrining those rights and protecting those rights is largely a collective responsibility, uh, not just the responsibility of financiers, um, but our collective responsibility as a society to ensure that these rights are, are protected uh, and the people that are trying to assert those rights are supported. One thing I, I guess just as a example within our own society and this is not the Rosslyn Yards building but we have retrofitted other a couple of other sites that we have and and in we actually have relocated tenants and paid the difference in rental costs while we have upgraded the buildings so but that becomes a value statement of our society as opposed to anything of a legal requirement. Great, thank you so much for um, all of your answers. And with that, we'll start wrapping up. So, uh, so we're just, we're putting a few plugs out there. If you um, are interested in any other uh, webinars or conferences. So we have, so there's an upcoming uh, CHRA webinar um, on how housing providers are tackling climate change and affordability at the same time on December 13th. And if you're interested in registering for that, the link is in the chat. This webinar will be in English only.
And as part of our GMF webinar series, we have another webinar coming up in December. I know you must all be very excited. This one will be on uh, supporting small and medium municipalities through the Community Buildings Retrofit Initiative. And we will be featuring the town of uh, Dieppe in New Brunswick. And so that will be on December 15th and at 1 p.m. as per usual. And so the link for that is also going to be in the chat if you would like to register. And finally, a huge plug for our Sustainable Communities Conference coming up in February, um, both in person and virtual in Ottawa. This is going to be a hybrid conference, uh, many great speakers and events and study tours and the links to check out the program and register for the conference are in the chat as well. And we hope to see you all in person there. So with that, uh, so thank you so much for coming to today's webinar. And thank you to Abby, Stacy, and Tanya for talking about energy efficiency, energy poverty, and the Rossland Yards project. And before you go, please fill out a quick poll so that we know how we can continue to improve going forward with this webinar series. And again, thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. And I hope you have an excellent rest of your day.